Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale Char B1 Bis French Heavy Tank. The model that you see here belongs to my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. If anyone is interested in having a model built to similar specs to the model that you see here, I often take on commission builds from models ranging from 135th scale all the way up to 1 6 scale. As for availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model that you see here is built mostly out of the box, however does feature several modifications that I made to the model, and which I'll be going over in this video. First, let's take a quick walk around the model. The Char B1 Bis was a heavy tank which was designed and used by the French during the early war period of World War II. The vehicle itself was designed during the interwar year periods and was produced in 1935 and its production went into 1940, only being halted by the invasion of France. At the time that this tank was designed and entered into production, the B1 Bis was considered to be the best tank in the world. The tank featured very effective and sufficient armor, and the armament that the tank also had was considered to be some of the best. The main armament of the tank was that of a hull-mounted 75mm gun, and in a revolving turret there was a smaller 47mm gun with a machine gun in the coaxial position. These tanks here were produced by Renault, and the tank's overall weight was 28 tons and had a crew of four. The tank was powered by a Renault inline six-cylinder 16.5 liter gas engine. And the tank had a top speed of approximately 17 miles an hour. The vehicle utilized a crew of four men. And the tank's construction itself was comprised out of a mix of rolled flat plate which was riveted together, combined with several sections of casted steel. This casted components would consist of mainly the front driver's position, the turret, as well as the trunnion and gun mount for the hull-mounted 75mm gun. This type of construction was standard for the period and was also found on several other tanks, namely that of the M3 Lee, as well as the Churchill and the Matildas. As for the running gear and suspension on this type of tank, the B1 Bissa suspension is in similar design to the tank designs that preceded it that date all the way back to World War I. Those designs are basically what was found on bulldozers and crawlers of the period, which ironically is still used today. The suspension comprised out of a row of road wheels and rollers, which were mounted on a pontoon. That pontoon itself was then internally supported by springs and leaf springs. The track that the tank has is also very similar to that which you would find on a bulldozer or an excavator, which is that of a cog chain style track with riveted pads that act as the track surfaces. These designs were again contemporary of the period and were considered to be the norm. To our modern eyes, the B1 Bis has a big cumbersome appearance and is not very imposing. However, back in 1940, this vehicle here would have been the most feared enemy tank that the Germans would have encountered on the French campaign. So much so that once France fell to the Germans, the Germans took a large majority of these captured B1 Bisses and pressed them into service for their own military. The Germans used the B1 Bis all the way up until the end of the war. Also, many of the B1 Bisses that the Germans used were recaptured later by the Free French Forces, which then repressed them back into French service. These vehicles here were also utilized again until the end of the war. The B1 Bisses design was also rejuvenated once the war ended and some of the very first post-war French tank designs were based off of B1 BIS components. 
Before I go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the models first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit was like. And here's the model just before the start of the project. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this Tamiya French B1 BIS heavy tank kit. The kit itself was acquired several years ago from Hobby Lobby. It was in a everything must go aisle and I acquired it for a very decent price. The kit has been sitting in the stash in this unbuilt condition ever since, which can be seen by the layer of dust on the cover. These kits have been around for a little while. The kit itself came out around 2005-2006 time frame and have a quite a decent fan following to them. In fact, there's also a lot of aftermarket components which can be purchased which can improve and upgrade the kit from the stock kit configuration. The kits themselves, I believe, might still be in production. They are fairly prolific and can be found either might, you might be lucky enough to score one at a local hobby shop or can easily be found on any of the online retailers like Amazon, eBay, or even any other online hobby shops which can be found on the net. The kit's prices aren't too bad. They can be had anywhere from about 35 to approximately 45 or 50 US dollars. The kit being a Tamiya, it's going to be all plastic injection molded this polystyrene assembly. However, this kit does supply the builder with a few extra add-ons which aren't typically found on normal or more of the more past Tamiya kits that were released. Starting with the kit itself, you can see here the box art's your standard Tamiya style box art. You have the tank with a camouflage pattern on a white background. Standard Tamiya graphic design. You do have several other paint variations, like this camouflage pattern here, as well as a picture of the completed model, which is painted like a box art, and which is a catalog photograph, as well as also some of the features. This kit here is unique in the tracks as well as the other parts, which I'll be going into as soon as I crack the box open. Opening the box first takes us to a color palette. As you can see, there are a few different paint variations in which to build this model. As well as different markings, which are all kit supplied. The opening up does supply you with a pretty handsome little piece with about the brief history of the Char B1 BIS, as probably as well as some other interesting facts that pertain to this vehicle. Looking at the box, it looks like your standard Tamiya style tooling. Everything like I mentioned before is injection molded plastic. It is a tan color which is typically found on their German tanks. Starting with the upper hull. As you can see it has some very nice detailing which is standard for Tamiya. All the panel lines are present as well as all the riveting detailing which is a trademark of the Char B1 BIS. Digging into the box takes us to first the turret runner. As you see, in addition to the plastic parts, there are some poly caps. More than likely, these are probably going to be used for the trunnion, as well as on the hull trunnion's gun, as well as maybe even some parts on the suspension, which is a trademark for Tamiya kits. Just like with the hull, the turret is the same type of quality, which is, you know, say, pretty good. Nice crisp tooling. And knowing Tamiya kits of the past should assemble with very little effort. Moving on from the tar it takes us to looks like some hull components, namely that of the side skirts or the top hull fenders. Moving further in the box takes us to the running gear. As you can see, the running gear looks to be very nicely done. Sprocket detailing is very crisp as well as all the small road wheels which are featured on a tank like this. Final runner, looks like it's the lower hull. The lower hull pan with some very nice under hull interior detailing, namely that of the escape hatch. And the final bit of detailing, which is in interesting for this kit, is that of the track. Now, one thing unique about the B1 
this kit from Tamiya is that unlike other Tamiya kits which utilize single piece vinyl or rubber tracks, the B1 BIS kit supplies you that of individual workable track links. The workable track links are a very nice touch and saves in having to acquire an aftermarket source which is something that most other modelers out there prefer to do. The pieces appear to be made out of a ABS plastic and appear to be a snap together assembly which needless to say is going to be very beneficial when it comes time to assemble these. The kit also supplies you with a length of real metal chain which again is greatly helps the detail of the model. Going to the actual instruction sheet, again it's your standard Tamiya style layout, which judging from the other Tamiya kits of the past should be very much of a well thought out process in terms of the assembly of the model. Finally at the bottom of the box takes us to the markings. Markings are your standard blue paper Tamiya decals with a protective tissue paper film. And from the other Tamiya kits that I've built in the past, the decals should apply on very easy and effortlessly. Starting with the model suspension, the entire running gear and suspension that you see on this model are all built out of box with absolutely no mods needed. The kit assembled very, very easily and actually very, very effortlessly. The What's unique about the Tamiya kit is that the suspension, all of the wheels that are found on the bottom portion here are all movable, as well as the sprocket and the front idler. What really makes this kit unique is, like I mentioned before in the unboxing, is the fact that the tracks are workable track link. Now, the track links themselves are probably the most easily assembled tracks that I have ever worked on. I have done lots of workable track links from 135 all the way up to my 1.6 scale armor techs. And I must say, of all the builds I've done, these tracks here assemble by far the quickest. With They are a simple snap together affair. And within approximately 5 to 10 minutes, I had both tracks fully assembled and with the correct tension around the, the hull itself. The tracks are also, since they are movable, they can roll with the tank if need be, which is an interesting side note as this model here is static. However, Tamiya did release a version of this kit which was single motor and motorized. The track being workable again does offer the maximum amount of detailing in that it's not a rubber of a single piece vinyl style track and with a track of this type of design i.e that of like a bulldozer or an excavator you really get to appreciate the track detailing if it was done workable as the way you see it here the track is also nice in case you want to have the model displayed in a diorama either as a knockout or if it being under maintenance with the crew, you could easily display the tank with the track in its off state. The under portion here is also fully detailed by Tamiya, so if the track is off the model, you do have the detailing there present. As a quick tip, along the top portion here of the hull, there are small little skid rails in which the track rolls on. A quick swipe of silver or steel paint gives you that nice patina look as these pieces here would wear very quickly due to the fact that the track's always in operation. While on the lower hull, takes us to first the bottom of the tank. As you can see, the bottom of the tank is nicely detailed. You do have escape hatch detailing as well as the other under portion reinforcement for the road wheels. The small over JD ribs are also present on the kit as well as the necessary riveting marks. Now also included is the small little rubber side skirt which is found on both sides of the inner portion. These are assembled as per the kit with the type of coloring that is re recommended in the instructions. What's interesting is that on the interior portion it is a dark black color or dark gray while on the exterior it is that of a brown color. This is again as per the kit's instructions. 
Moving our way to the front portion of the model, the starting with the tank's main gun, just like with many other tanks of the period, namely that of the M3 Lee, the B1 Bis had its main armament mounted inside of the tank's hull. The gun itself is fully detailed, it has a small little milled notch on either side of the barrel, which is as per the real vehicle, and this is again molded with the kit. The gun barrel can go up and down, and assembles very easily again all out of box. One little mod I made to the gun was that this is as per the box art there's a small steel sleeve on the inner portion of the barrel. This was represented on my model with a simple brush of paint. Moving from the gun takes us to the bow headlight. The headlight that you see here is an optional piece that is supplied with the kit and like with many other kits which have a hollow bell housing headlight, they have a small opaque piece of plastic which gets glued to the lens portion. Just like on most of my builds, rather than using the opaque lens, I simply filled in the hollow headlight canister with that of clear epoxy. The clear epoxy replicates that of the glass lens and also helps the look of the model. Moving from the spare light takes us to the main headlight. The main headlight with the kit is nicely detailed and does have interior detailing. Now the B1 BIS is again a very simplistic early pattern vehicle in which the piece here is protected by a shield. The shield itself has to be manually lifted out of the way in order to have the light shine. Now the kit does supply you with the piece that's the shield and it's a spare or it's a separate casting compared to the headlight itself. And the kit wants you to mount it either open or in the closed state. Well, on my model here, I made the piece functional. The way this is done is that I simply took a Dremel. I Dremeled out the hinge portion that's molded into the lid, as well as the receptacle on the light, and installed a small little pin. With the pin installed, the piece can operate and hinge open. Moving on from the headlight, moves us up to the driver's position on the tank. Now, the B1 BIS does have a direct driver's vision block, which is, again, another common feature found on tanks of the period. The Tamiya kit does have the visor block as a separate plastic component compared to the front armor shield. Now, the Tamiya kit does, again, have an option to either mount the component in the open or closed state. However, with a quick little modification, I went ahead and added two little rails that hold the component in place. The rails are made out of just two little strips of plastic, which allowed the visor to be fully functional. As you see, now it's closed, and I can open it with a little push of a small little tool. A similar d feature was also done with the main driver's hatch. The hatch, again, is also designed to be either mount modeled in the closed or open state. And again, with simple Dremel, I drilled out two little parts of the hinge and was able to make the piece operational. If you notice, I'm moving the component with the turret off the vehicle as the BIS needs to have the turret in a certain position in order to get access to the driver's hatch. And it's easier to see the detailing on the interior portion if the tart was temporarily removed. Now the hinge does not open fully. However, does it is a nice little feature to add, specifically one that did not take much effort to do. Now one component that's interesting on the Tamiya kit that is functional is this top plate here. This is mold connected to a small little arm that is supplied with the model. The component, if assembled very carefully, can be made to be fully functional. As for what this component does, that I am unsure of, and if anyone does know the purpose of this sliding little plate here, feel free to add that in the comment section listed below. Moving our way to the aft of the model takes us to the first the rear plate. As you can see, the rear plate is distinctive on the BIS with having a lot of chain mounted in this location here. Just like what was mentioned in the unboxing, all of the chain that you see on this model is supplied with the kit. The kit also has a detailed instruction section in which it describes exactly the orientation of how you rig the chain in the format that you see here. Moving up from the chain takes us to the tank's exhaust system. Now the exhaust system on the Tamiya kit does have some options. 
the pattern that you see here is one style and there's another style which has longer little funnels that come out and the funnels themselves are a different shape. As for which ones to use, this is very crucial as the type of paint pattern that the tank receives will also affect the exhaust manifolds that are on the model as the markings and pattern are not, apparently are only found on certain ver versions. This is also true for the top fenders. The top, you have two options of fenders that roll uh, um, over the top portion of the tank. If you notice, this version here has a gap that's in between the hull and the track. The other variant that is supplied with the kit, this gap here is not present and it's just a continuous unit. Again, this combination with the exhaust also needs to be paid attention to if following the painting and marking guide that is supplied with the kit. Moving towards the tank's antenna base, the antenna base that you see here again is purely stock and no mods were needed to be made. As for the paint, the paintwork on the antenna base is that which is very similar on many of my other antenna bases. The base itself is made out of, would be made out of a ceramic material and is a dark red coloring. In addition to the dark red coloring, I went ahead and added a brush of clear coat to the ceramic portion in order to give that nice luster that you would see typically on ceramic pieces of the era. The antenna stub itself would be black, and again, all the details are molded in nice and crisply onto the piece, and it just requires a little bit dab of paint in order to really make it pop. While on the upper deck, there are several small little holes that the model builder will have to drill into the hull in order to mount the components that you see here that are supplied with the kit. Now, the kit does label the components on where to mount them on the instruction sheet. As you can see, you have here a small little chart that shows where to dremel out the small little holes. The holes have to be done with a dremel with a very small bit, so some equipment will be required to assemble this kit outside of basic modeling tools. However, the holes drill out very simply, and once done pr properly, the pieces will simply just drop right on. Now, it's important to note, though, that on the bottom of the kit, there are several options available. The ones marked F are the version that you will need to drill out in order to build the tank as a French tank. However, there are several other holes which are marked with the letter G, which do not get drilled out on this kit if building it as French, and that one is for the other B1 BIS kit, which is made by Tamiya, which is that of a German-captured version of the B1. In addition to drilling out the holes, there are a few rivets that need to be amputated in order to also mount on the components. They too are listed in the instruction sheet and care needs to be exhibited in knowing which rivets are the ones that need to be deleted and in the manner in which they are deleted. A nice sharp X-Acto knife is the best bet for removing the necessary pieces. Also supplied with the tank are four jacks that you see here. These jacks here are designed on the real tank to mount to these little brackets which are found on the front and rear of the vehicle. The ones you see here are, are simply the ones that are from the box and they are simply painted and weathered in the format that you see here. Now there are no mounts in which to mount these components to the top deck. The instructions kind of recommends that you put them in this location here. However, without any strapping equipment required or that's present, I'm going to leave them off of the model. However, it's nice that they meant that they included these pieces again for diorama use, which plays an effect with that of the workable track. Moving our way to the turret, the turret again is purely stock and assembles very easy and effortlessly. Two areas on the turret to watch out for. First is that there will be a small little seam where the two halves of the turret meet, which is basically the same on just about all tank kits. A little bit of CA and some sandpaper was able to buff away the seam to a nice seamless appearance that you have here. The gun does go up and down as which is standard on pretty much all AFV kits. And one mod that I made though was to the machine gun stub. The coaxial machine gun is supplied with the kit, however, just like with many other plastic model kits, it's a simple molded component with no muzzle end detailing. The muzzle end detailing was simply added with that of a Dremel with a very, very fine bit. Like I often mention 
want on procedures like this. This is something best left done to someone that has a very steady hand and has had some experience with drilling small little holes like this. The reason is that something like this, even though it's simple to add, is also very easily screwed up if the Dremel is going too fast, if you have a dull bit or a broken bit, and if you're not steady with your hand. So something like this is best done after a little bit of practice, but once done, really helps the look of the machine gun that is found on the model. Moving our way to the tank's commander's copula. The copula itself is able to fully rotate, just like on the real vehicle, and is actually a nice touch that, to me, I went with this route as opposed to just molding it in or having it glued in place as what would be seen on some other manufacturers. The copula itself is an interesting casting the way it was done from the kit it is actually two pieces and the seam line would be running directly down the center portion of the copula. This is something that needs to be buffed away as you don't want to have that nice ugly seam running on your piece which can hurt the look of the model. Fortunately just like with the turret the seam it's very easily polished away and again was done with a simple drop of thick CA and a little bit of sandpaper. After some polishing later, the piece is completely smooth without any trace of the seam. Now, one nice feature is that the periscope detailing that you see here on the side is a separate molar component to that of the copula. One, when building the model, you want to first glue the halves together and fully delete the seam just prior to assembly and installation of the small little periscope. As once this component gets added, deletion of the seam will become a lot more difficult compared to when it's off. One mod that I made to the copula was that on the front visor. The B1 bis does have a little movable shield that is positioned in this location here. Just like with the headlight, the kit gives you the option to either have the piece in the closed state or in the open state. Well, just like with the headlight, I went ahead and made a quick little mod to the piece to make it functional. Again, done with a Dremel, a small bit, and a pin, the piece was made to work so I could display the model either with the piece flipped up or in the down state. Moving on to paint and markings, the markings and paint pattern that you see on the model here are basically the exact same ones which are found on the tank's box art. Like what was shown in the unboxing, there are lots of paint and marking variations to be utilized on this model here with just this kit alone. To me, uh, in addition to the motorized unit of this kit, also made another version of this kit, which is that of a vehicle which was captured and utilized by the Germans. That kit itself also has three or four other paint variations that can be added to the same type of vehicle. As for the decals, the decals that you see on the kit are again the kit supply ones and as with all Tamiya kits are very high quality. They applied with no issues and lacquered on and weathered again with no issues as well. When it comes to mounting on the, the hearts which are found on the turret, you do have to make a small little adjustment to the decal. The, deca the markings are found right over the little hooks which are found on the sides of the turret. With an X-Acto knife, you need to put a small little incision on the corner of the piece in order for the marking to slip on in the correct, appropriate way that you see here. It's also a good idea to, with an X-Acto knife, add a small little cut line along the visor, both on the perimeter as well as on the prism itself. By doing that, once the piece is lacquered on, you get the nice little seam lines which would indicate that the piece is separate, otherwise the marking would just simply cover up the visor which would hurt the look of the model. As for recommendations and kit difficulty, the model here is extremely easy to build and is equally as well engineered by Tamiya. The model itself went together very quickly and very effortlessly. The entire kit itself took approximately 48 hours to build, assemble, paint, and weather to the con condition that you see it here. The model itself can definitely be built by a beginner, uh, as with the caveat with that of a Dremel in having to Dremel out some of the smaller holes. However, if someone does have a Dremel with a tiny bit on hand, a beginner can definitely tackle one of these kits, in my opinion. The only areas to 
keep in mind of would be of course the dremeling and to take your time with that of the suspension and with the way the hull panels get assembled. There was no fitting issues at all, but time and care do need to be exerted in order so everything lines up correctly and sets in the appropriate location. If care is exhibited on those parts of the build, the build will roll just as smoothly. In addition to the kit being well engineered, the kit's availability and price is also very, very reasonable. With that in mind, like I mentioned before, you could really play around with a different type of paint and marking variations and have lots of separate versions of the same tank which can look different from each other. The model itself I definitely recommend for a fan of the early war period, the fan of the Blitzkrieg as well as the early 1940 France campaign, as well as just French tank aficionados in general. The B1BIS was a very important tank used by the French Army of the time and was also one of those kits that, or one of those vehicle types that were eluding the large scale plastic manufacturers in 135th scale for many decades. Even though this kit is a little bit dated today, it came out approximately 10 years ago, it's still just as relevant today as a build as it was when it first came out and is again highly recommended. And that concludes this model showcase video for this 135th scale Char B1 BIS French heavy tank. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to check out eastcoastarmory.com for more 16 and 116 scale builds and detail components. Thank you.